In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses uh, 9 and 10, King David is now old, and he's about to die. As so many men of God did in the Old Testament accounts, David called to him the son responsible to carry on the ministry of the father. And now in this passage, David called to him his son Solomon with the purpose of communicating to him not only an historic task, that of building a magnificent temple in which God had said He would dwell, and communicate along with that the blueprints. But at the same time, he also communicated a blueprint for life, that if Solomon successfully followed it, would ensure a life of blessing that would not only impact Solomon, but his family in the entire nation. But in this blueprint for life, David not only provided the plan uh, which we previously presented in part one of this series, but he identified the power which was the subject of part two. Now today, Isaac and I will conclude King David's blueprint by presenting the warning or the poison to be avoided. By application, of course, is that this entire blueprint with the plan and the power and the poison, it has application to every person watching right now, to Isaac and I and all of you. And it's applicable, it's accurate, it's relevant to each of us, and I would say to all who have ears to hear, as it was for Solomon so many thousands of years ago. So Isaac, let's pick up on this a little bit. It's a great passage. We've already gone through it, but just in case there's some watching this today who maybe did not catch uh, the other two, uh, we talked about the power and the plan. We'll summarize that just a little bit. But would you take and read the essence of this passage again and just establish where we are so we, everybody gets on the same page here today? Sure, yeah. It's just such a beautiful covenanting uh, cer ceremony that they're having. You see David talking to all the leadership, but then he zeroes in right to his son. It's kind of like uh, a wedding ceremony. You, mm -hmm. you have, oh, welcome everybody before God and these witnesses. He basically says those words, and then you give this charge to the couple that's making the covenant. Well, he gives this charge to his son who's taking over. We get to that part in verse 9. He says, And thou, Solomon my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. And then he gives these plans for the temple and he tells them, he says that the Lord gave me these plans, much like Moses was given mm -hmm. plans for the tabernacle by the Lord himself. Um, he says in verse 19, uh, the Lord made me understand and by writing of his hand upon me all of these works and patterns. And then he gives another charge mm -hmm. to Solomon, again, kind of coming back to where he started with, making sure that Solomon understands this. He says, uh, verse 20, and David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Hmm. And so there, there we have this, again, beautiful covenant service going on here. And what a, what a neat example for us to see the passing from one generation to the next that, that we all would like to see that happen in our homes, in our churches, uh, wherever God has given us authority, that we would see um, that, that Spirit of the Lord upon us, but being given to and told to and blessings, you know, going with it to that next generation. So we'll talk more about that in this part three of the Blueprint for Life. We'll be right back on Stand in the Gap. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history, or powerfully relevant. Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs. The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. 
This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to the program. And I don't know if you've ever maybe gone through job training or had a parent tell you something, uh, make sure you do this. Maybe um, somebody was leaving. You know, sometimes my wife does that if, if she's going somewhere and I'm supposed to do dinner with the kids. Make sure you follow the instructions and gives a recipe or whatever. Well, in some cases, it can be even more important. And, and here's David knowing that he's at the end of his life and at the end of his ministry before the Lord, and he's handing it off to his son Solomon, who was chosen by God to, to succeed him. And so we, we read through the, a little bit of this passage again, but this is, is part three of God's blueprint for life. And Sam, we've looked at uh, you know, the, the, the plan and the power that led up to this, and today we're going to look at take heed of this, forsake that, you know, watch out for, don't put this into it kind of a thing. But before we get to the poison, could you just review those first steps for us and kind of bring us back up to speed with, with where this passage has taken us so far? Yeah, absolutely, Isaac. And I think this, you know, one of the, one of the fantastic things about here is that, you know, throughout Scripture, there, God builds in principles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the principles here was that, um, uh, God had a calling on Solomon's life. He had a calling on David's life that was being communicated to Solomon, and the task was to build a temple, right? Nobody had built a temple before. What's a temple look like? Mm. Um, what is this thing? Well, so, so, so David um, actually um, drew up the literal blueprints. So I build a house, you've been involved, mm. we all, anybody who knows knows blueprints. You've got to follow them very carefully. You lay a foundation, and you build the walls, and then you, then you equip it. Uh, the, those blueprints and other passages in Scripture will give some evidence of the detail mm. of the actual blueprints of the temple. But, you know, um, what we leave behind, Isaac, in the form of a building or a house is not nearly so important as what we leave behind in a legacy of our life. Mm. And so this is, this passage here, is why we call it the blueprint for life. Because the building of the temple and the purpose for the temple that God would dwell in it, and out of that would come blessing to the people of Israel, was dependent on Solomon living his life appropriately before God so that God, in fact, could bless. But that principle um, applies to every one of us today. So that's the application here. So what did he basically say? Well, he said, he said three things. Know thou the God of thy father, serve him with a perfect heart in verse 9 of 1 Chronicles chapter 28. And the idea there, and then of, uh, of serving him and then seeking him. And I think those are interesting. As we talked about before Isaac a little bit, David said, and was able to say to Solomon, you know my God who I served. Hmm. But you have to know Him. And to know Him is not know about Him. He's really saying you must absolutely know Him, which is a, which is a choice. It's not accidental. Us knowing God and walking with the Lord is not a one-time, oh, I read about God and, oh, that's the way it is. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's not accidental. It takes time, and, and, the, and it's not just any God. Hmm. The God of thy fathers, Jehovah God. So all the way through, if we're going to be successful in life, we know that we're going to worship some God. But it's the God of heaven, Jehovah God. And we have to know Him personally. Of course, we know now as believers, we know Him through faith in Jesus Christ. At this point, Jesus Christ, they looked forward to the, the coming of Christ. We now look back to Christ. So that's one, know Him. Secondly, serve Him. You know, as we talked about before, all of us in our lives are going to serve something. We either serve ourselves, we serve something that somebody else wants us to do, or we're going to serve the God of heaven. And he told Solomon, you're going to be king. You're going to have a lot of people serve you. But you'd better not forget that you are serving somebody. First of all, that's got to be the God of heaven. Again, it's a choice. Also, it's a heart matter. And I think that's a critical thing, because God searches our hearts. Um, but 
what we do with our mouth and our actions and our attitudes first starts in our heart. So he says, make sure your heart is right, your attitude. Then, then seek him. And that's the idea, I think, Isaac, that, um, that as, God, as David was telling Solomon, um, the being on a path of relationship with the God of heaven, living in obedience to what he says, is a continual seeking. We must search for him as we search for truth. And again, not a one-time decision, but an every day. So that's really the whole aspect of it. And then he said, here's the power, and that power was heed him. Obey my word. I, I'm, he said, I'm not going to tell you to do something impossible. The, the word of God, um, do it. And then that was the courage part. And then he said, just act upon it. Trust a God and then just do what He told you to do regardless of what people around you try to, uh, you know, get you to keep from doing. So that's in essence the overview, Isaac. So it was a plan. Know Him, serve Him, seek Him. There's a power involved in it. Heed Him. Do what God's Word says and don't give in to fear. Be courageous and do it. Mm. All right. Now, that's the, that's the overview. But you know, um, here's an interesting part, because in here it comes and it says, he gives a warning, if you seek him, he'll be found of you, but if you forsake him, he'll cast you off forever. Um, Isaac, so many promises in Scripture, particularly as God would give it to, na to nations or whatever, are what we'd call a conditional promise. If you do what I say, then I will do what I say, I'll bless you. But if you don't, then something else is going to happen. Just build it out a little bit. Why does God give so many promises or warnings to His people in the terms of a condition, if, then? Mm. Yeah, that, you're, you, you're right. Throughout Scripture, we see this in His covenants. Uh, the last time that God gives instructions for His dwelling places, uh, for the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle. Well, that's, that comes with the Ten Commandments. So there's, there's a law that was laid down that came with Moses receiving the instructions for the tabernacle of God. And, uh, and so there were these stipulations. But we can go all the way back to the very beginning when God makes human life. He makes Adam in the Garden of Eden, and He says, all of these you know, trees are here for your good, except do not take so there's, there's a condition. Don't take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so from the, the Garden of Eden, throughout all of, of the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, we see covenants and conditions. Um, and then we get to the New Testament, and we're saved by grace. But even, even being saved by grace, uh, you know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, that whosoever believeth in Him. It's not for everybody. It's only for those who believe. In uh, Romans uh, chapter 9, 10, and 11, he goes through this, and he, he talks about, and he says in Romans 10, for example, verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord mm -hmm. shall be saved. Our salvation rests upon Jesus Christ. We can't save ourselves, but not everybody will be saved. Those who believe, those who call upon the name of the Lord. And he says, so how do they go without you know, hearing? So it, it is the, um, you know, very interesting that we would, and, and expect it, that we would see this if, if uh, David has received this from the Lord. We talk about you know, Solomon's temple. It's really not Solomon's mm. temple. David mm. did the gathering, but it, it's God's temple. And if you would ask Solomon, I think he would point that out. But we, you know, historically, we say, oh, that's the King Solomon, his leadership provided that. But it, it makes sense then that if this is going to be the dwelling place of God, which again, this is Old Testament. So New Testament, we have Jesus Christ has come. He says, this now is my covenant. This is the Testament in my blood. He fulfilled all of this. And we don't now need to, to go find God at a tabernacle or a mm. temple. We now have the Holy Spirit living in us. It, it, it's changed all this, but we, we have to accept Christ. You can't just say, well, I think I'm a good person. I'm an American or I'm a Christian because I grew up that way. We have to accept Christ. And so, um, can I throw, a, throw in a question for you right now as you're talking about a thought this comes mm -hmm. to my mind here again. It's interesting here that this was all about the building hmm. of a physical temple 
And, uh, and Solomon had questions to God in Second Chronicles chapter 6, that the whole chapter mm -hmm. was, God, are you really, I mean, really are you going to come down and dwell in a building made by hands? It was a phenomenal thought. But now moving it up to where we are right now, um, as believers in the New Testament, we are told that our bodies mm -hmm. are the temple of the Holy Spirit, so that in every true believer, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in our bodies, which is a temple. And I just wonder for a comment from you is that if the pattern for life, the blueprint for life and living, was important for Solomon, who was building a temple, a physical building, mm -hmm. Does it not make that much more application for us who carry around in us as a temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit living within us? Does not it make this blueprint for life even more important for us to observe now than even then? I think you're right. Every time that one is fulfilled, it becomes even more important. So we're to seek first God's kingdom, not the kingdom of, you know, physical, but God's kingdom in what? And seek his righteousness, which, which brings me back to this poison mm -hmm. that we're talking about avoiding the unrighteous. Is what, can you explain this to me? He says, you know, don't forsake me. Watch out for this. Can you talk to us about that? Well, you know, I can. And I, I, I think, and I don't think, I, Isaac, I can explain in, in the fullest of context, but I do know this. We talk on this program a lot, our daily, our radio program in here. Got to define the terms. Hmm. Define the terms. Hmm. <laughs> so what does it mean to forsake? Hmm. He said, if thou seek him, Psalm, if you seek God, he will be found of you, right? But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Boy, if that isn't a consequential statement. Well, here's what forsake means. It simply means this, to leave uh, or to depart from or to abandon. It can also mean to apostatize. It's interesting, Genesis 2.24, here's one of the first applications or usages of the word uh, forsake. Genesis 2.24, therefore shall I man leave his father and his mother. Same word, forsake. Okay, here's where you were. You grew up in a family. You have a father and a mother, but when it's time to come to choose a wife, which God said, this is what you should do, you forsake, you leave, you abandon, not the relationship, but you abandon the authority. You're no longer under your parents. All right. That's the idea. Um, but in Genesis 28, 15, God said to Abraham, you're talking about a covenant? Mm -hmm. God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said this here, all the, after he gave the promises to Abraham of a, of a, of a, of a nation, of a people, of, a, of, a, of boundaries, of land, he said, for I will not leave until I have done all which I've spoken unto you. Now that's an interesting thing because when God makes a promise that he will not leave, abandon, forsake, he'll keep it. Hmm. Because it's the character and nature of God. He can't do what he's promised not to do. But for people, hmm. We have a real problem in holding and doing what we have said to do. Now here's an example, Joshua 24, 16 says this, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. That was when Joshua was there. Then just a few verses later, Joshua reminded the people, Joshua 24, 20, If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. Just exactly what was being said here by David to Solomon. And then just one book later, Isaac, Judges 2.12, and the people forsook the Lord God of their fathers, and they served foreign gods, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. You know, it's a continual reminder the Old Testament is all about God's people having God's promises, just like Solomon, being told what God's blessings would be, 
And then they were also told, don't forsake. Hmm. And they even said, oh, we won't forsake the Lord. How many times, Isaac, do we say to God, oh, no, 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 I'm going to serve you. And then we walk and go away the other way. You know, I, I think this as we wrap up this segment. When we forsake God, I don't believe that it's any more of, it's not a, it could be a singular point, but generally when we walk away from God and forsake God, it is, it is, it's something that never happens in a moment. It's something that happens moment by moment. When we walk away from God and seek and, and no longer know Him, serve Him, or seek Him, the result will be we will forsake Him. It's a choice, but there are things that can happen. And, and those of you who are watching us, we're all in this boat together, are we not? When we come back, we're going to close the program a little bit. I'm going to ask Eric, uh, Isaac to share a few things of, right, all right, all right, forsake. It's, it, the consequences are enormous. But what are some things that we can do to help us not walk away and forsake the God who has given us so much? Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand. Or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Well, in your walk with the Lord, as you're looking at this, I've walked with the Lord. The Lord saved me when I was seven years old. I've had a long walk with the Lord. But I can also say that... Um, um, is it possible to walk away from the Lord and to um, step away? It can. Will the Lord ever forsake us? No, He won't, not if we know Him. But we can walk and get ourselves into trouble. That's the poison in God's blueprint for living. Isaac, as we kind of wrap it up, the practical application, can you share some things uh, with our viewers and just remind ourselves of some things that we can do to help us from walking away and forsaking the Lord? So, you know, I think the goal is to seek God first and then mm. everything else. Matthew talks about, you know, Jesus' teaching on the mount and, and in chapter 6 of Matthew, we have that famous, you know, account, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and then all these other things will be added unto you. Also, in that same chapter, he teaches about prayer, and he, he reminds us of the Lord's teaching on prayer um, in chapter 6. And he says um, that, uh, that we pray for thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so uh, we, we want to put Christ first. We want to put God first, and then everything else falls into place after. Well, then the question is, how do we do that? And you said, can you remind us? That's how we do it. We, we remember mm. the works of the Lord. You look at what mm. David was doing. Mm. What was David doing leading up to, we have all these chapters before chapter 28. He's recounting what God has done. And he's even in his charge to Solomon. My God has not failed me. He will not fail you. You do this. This is what God is. He's repeating what, Joseph, or what Joshua had told the people. Joshua was repeating what Moses had told the people. Hmm. These, th this is the way God is. And we remember what God has done and how faithful he has been to us. We count our blessings. We thank him and we pass it on to others telling them about it. Hmm. And, and I think that that is a, one of the ways we can, we can keep from being poisoned. You know, Isaac, I mean, I, you could preach an entire sermon, and you have, <laughs> because we can build all these points out. But, I, you know, I just what you said, right priorities. Hmm. Um, if we don't start with God and finish with God, we're going to end up starting with ourselves and end with ourselves, and that's disaster. Mm -hmm. That's forsaking God. And the, and the other thing that you said, and ladies and gentlemen, with this, I'll just close. You know, one of the, one of the instructions that God gave to the Israelites when they went into the Promised Land he told the fathers, tell your children, tell your grandchildren, remind them of all that God has done. Be grateful to God. You know, one of the greatest antidotes to pride and to walking away from God 
into idolatry, which is what God hates so terribly? Well, it's, it's reminding that everything that we have has come from God. All the blessings we have are from Him. God's given us free will. We're not robots. We need to make choices. Choose Him. Know Him. Serve Him. Seek Him. And then keep Him first. And be grateful to the God of Heaven. That is God's blueprint for living. It worked for Solomon if he would have done it. And it works for us when we do it.